Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Tony Kelly. I uh, do uh, pediatric uh, ear, nose, and throat uh, here at the Children's Hospital. Um, Dr. Puricelli, my one of my colleagues, uh, was hoping to be here, but he's on call and had some things come up. So unfortunately, he's not able to join us. But um, our group, uh, not only Dr. Puricelli and I, but uh, our other colleagues all have um, um, interest in uh, sleep apnea and have uh, take care of lots of uh, children with Down syndrome. And so uh, something that's um, kind of near and dear to us as well. Um, the talk, you know, and Dr. Matthews probably experienced this putting your talk together. It's something that, you know, we could talk for hours on this. And so really trying to distill uh, our um, comments down to 20 to 30 minutes is a little challenging so um but open to some questions at the end i'll try to approach things kind of from the otolaryngology uh, perspective um and some of my slides i think overlap a little bit with dr matthews but that's okay well we'll zip through those um and i the talk uh, will focus um primarily on um clearly there's if there's non-surgical options and given that this is a, a common problem and a challenging problem uh, for uh, sleep apnea and children with Down syndrome, I think it's it's an evolving field, right? And and so things like um, oral appliances and um, oral maxil or, or oral myofascial therapy, which like tongue and uh, uh, strengthening the muscles, that's, that's things that may evolve into more um, a, a viable viable um, options or at least um, contributing to uh, helping these patients. So, um, so uh, in general, we'll, we'll look at some of the, uh, and the, I think maybe the first couple points here are ones that Dr. Matthews already covered, but um, some of the, uh, when we look specifically at otolaryngologic uh, manifestations um, and how these might predispose uh, to sleep disordered breathing or sleep apnea. Um, and then uh, Talk about our, our approach from the ENT standpoint of the how do we you know um, offer management and kind of think about what's going to be the right uh, uh, management options for each patient. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about you know so tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy is generally considered first line, but it's not perfect. And there's certainly patients who still have sleep apnea even after that, unfortunately. And so how do we approach that? Um, so. Um, this slide, basically, uh, we're all different. And, uh, and though there are some typical manifestations of Down syndrome, they're, you know, each person is different in, in terms of um, uh, uh, severity and which, which specific manifestations affect each person uh, can be different. Um, from the uh, ENT standpoint, uh, there's lots of things that we uh, see Down syndrome patients for, including ear issues. And so pretty much all levels of the ear can be impacted. The narrowness of the ear canal, more likely to have chronic uh, middle ear infections or fluid, uh, and then also actually inner ear abnormalities, including you know cochlear abnormalities. So uh, ears and hearing are kind of the things that we definitely see Down syndrome patients for a lot. Um, nasal and sinus troubles, uh, uh, not only because of the size and shape of the nasal passages and the drainage pathways from the sinuses, uh, but also um, impact of immune, um, some subtle immune deficiencies, I think that can occur as well. Uh, sleep apnea, uh, again, as Dr. Matthews mentioned, there's some, uh, some structural uh, things that uh, put uh, patients with Down syndrome at more risk for uh, sleep apnea. Not all patients have all these things, and, and uh, but, but there's kind of a long list there, but um, uh, all could, could be contributors. Uh, looking further down the airway, we also see patients who have um, airway issues uh, or issues that can affect the uh, uh, eating and swallowing. And so um, at the level of the voice box, there's something called laryngomalacia, which is... Um, uh, floppiness or dynamic uh, collapse of some of the structures that are just above the, the, the vocal cords. Um, but even below the vocal cords, we sometimes encounter, and this is less on the topic of sleep apnea, but uh, issues with um, narrowing or floppiness of the trachea that can, can cause airway symptoms. Uh, and it's really common. Um, so uh, won't belabor this point, but um, you know the uh, it's common. <laughs> we already kind of covered that. Um, and the very last bullet point, uh, which um, is you know poses challenge to challenges to all of us, is that um, 
it's not only common, but sometimes it's hard to tell. And so uh, can be asymptomatic uh, in a lot of a lot of the children with Down syndrome. Um, and there's a connection uh, with, and this is not just with Down syndrome. Uh, I think this uh, across the board, I think uh, obesity is a, a contributing factor that can uh, impact the likelihood of having sleep apnea, the severity of sleep apnea, and the uh, how we treat it and the success that we uh, can achieve uh, 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 with various treatment options. Uh, observation, uh, again, as Dr. Matthews uh, mentioned, can be an option. The first study is a study on um, uh, children, uh, non-syndromic children, um, where with mild sleep apnea, based on the number of pauses that occurred during the, the night on a sleep study, uh, they did a study where they had a one treatment arm where they um, uh, didn't do anything. They just did a repeat sleep study uh, ballpark you know, six to nine months later. Um, and then they had also did a tonsil and act, and tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy on uh, the other uh, branch. And they saw that uh, even without any specific treatment, a, a good percentage of children had normalization of the sleep study numbers. What I didn't put on here is that um, when they, this study also looked at things like um, cognitive and behavioral uh, uh, outcomes, uh, and those didn't improve quite as much, um, even in those patients where their uh, sleep study numbers improved. Um, so sleep, I guess, point there is sleep studies are great, and that's a tool that we use as kind of considered our gold standard, but it may not be a perfect measure, <laughs> I think, of all the things that are important to us um, related to sleep. Um, and again, with children who are normal or who are overweight or obese, um, they're less likely to get better just with observation alone. Uh, patients specifically with Down syndrome um, or you know, children with Down syndrome, uh, observation or use of uh, singular or like a, a flow nase, like a nasal steroid spray. Um, some patients do get better, but it's not a huge number um, and, and uh, sometimes even gets worse. Um, and like you might expect patients who have moderate to severe um, numbers on the sleep study are less likely to get all the way better um, than patients whose sleep study numbers were, were mild to start with. Uh, CPAP, uh, I don't uh, manage this, Dr. Matthews does, but I'm certainly aware of it. And um, my you know, take on it is that it works and it's safe, uh, but it only works if you wear it. Um, and getting it, patients to wear it's not easy, um, kids or adults. So where uh, otolaryngology comes into play is when we're starting to look at potential surgical management options. And um, tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy in children with sleep apnea uh, is considered uh, first-line surgical treatment um, by the um, academies of pediatrics and, and otolaryngology as well. Um, and so, and there's lots of studies that have been done looking at uh, success rates, and there's different ways you can uh, gear, uh, gauge what your success rate is, but if it's based on sleep study numbers, uh, cure of uh, having, you know, low enough numbers where it's not considered sleep apnea occurs in 60 to 80 percent of, this is actually non-syndromic patients. Um, so um, even in children without Down, Down syndrome, um, it's not as high of a percent uh, cure as we might like. Um, lots of other surgeries, the cure rates are much higher than that. So, uh, but, uh, but, it, but it's, um, it's uh, still considered kind of a frontline uh, treatment. Uh, when it's uh, we studies that have looked at uh, our outcomes with uh, tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy in children with Down syndrome, um, it's helpful, but still uh, 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 um, relatively high rates of uh, persistent sleep apnea. So uh, these are several different studies. Um, cure rates, again, sort of depends on where you put the bar in terms of what's considered cure. Um, uh, you get different numbers. Um, but as you can kind of see from, you know, scanning through these, um, it's relatively low numbers. And sometimes, unfortunately, patients actually get worse. And there's probably different factors for that. I don't think it's the surgery made them get worse. I don't think. Um, but there, there, there may be uh, situations where, unfortunately, it doesn't help or um, there's still a persistent issue. Um, so... <laughs> How do we approach the situation where patients had already had tonsil and adenoid removed, uh, and now they've had another sleep study uh, and still shows uh, obstructive sleep apnea? Um, so um, I 
try to look for clues. So like we try to uh, kind of see if we can pick up any specific clues from the sleep study. Um, talking with the, the patient and the family about what kind of specific symptoms they're having that um, that they're observing at home, because you can sometimes pick up clues about what level of the airway might be the persistent trouble. Um, are there room? Is there any room for improvement in terms of any medical treatments, uh, as Dr. Matthews mentioned, uh, improving breathing through the nose if a patient has allergies or even non-allergic congestion? Um, uh, things I didn't list it here, but things like uh, reflux, um, uh, working on uh, weight management, things like that. Um, and then I'm always, you know, when I see these patients, um, a lot of times Dr. Matthews has already seen them, but not always. And, uh, and so sometimes I, I kind of circle back, like, is CPAP an option? And because uh, there are different, different additional surgeries, and I'm going to talk about here, but surgery is surgery, right? And, and there's always potential risks to that. And we want to make sure we're balancing risk versus benefit. Um, I think about the, uh, you know, sleep apnea is a problem of the upper airway and the upper airway is everything from the, and so tonsil and adenoid is in that, uh, space, but that's not the only thing that's in that space. And so, uh, trying to think about all the different anatomy along the, that pathway that potentially could be contributing. Um, and there are occasions where we'll find, oh, ha ha, this this one, you know, specific piece of anatomy, but sometimes it's not, uh, uh, and sometimes it's uh, more of a combination of things, and often that's uh, the way it is with uh, more complex sleep apnea, where um, there's a variety of uh, contributing factors, and you kind of need to sort through which of those are the most likely and, you know, uh, kind of rank order them. Um, I kind of uh, key in on, you know, are there, uh, is, does the voice sound different? Do they have other airway symptom striders, like a noisy breathing sound, um, body mass index, um, just general appearance and size and shape of the mid face and, and uh, lower jaw. Um, if there's tone issues, these are all things that, you know, generally can impact uh, uh, sleep apnea. Specific anatomy, looking in the nose, so um, kind of the nasal pyramid, the, the nasal septum, um, the uh, turbinates, which are these little shelves in the nose um, that do get more swollen or more congested, like when you get a cold or allergy flare-up or something like that. Uh, and then they should get less uh, congested and that, those fluctuations are normal, um, but there are sometimes situations where patients can have it's probably more complicated than this, but the way I think of it is like two steps forward, one step back kind of thing, and where they may have um, enlargement of the turbinate that's enlarged at baseline. It still fluctuates, but it never really small again. So uh, breathing uh, difficulties through the nose, particularly in somebody who might already have a sm smaller nasal passage, um, uh, can, can be a problem. Uh, and then certainly if there's polyps or other masses or something in the nose, that could pose a problem. Uh, looking in the mouth, uh, uh, again, most uh, in these this situation, they probably shouldn't have tonsils, but certainly if there's tonsillar tissue that's still there for whatever reason, uh, that could it could pose a problem. Um, this picture kind of shows the um, there's different uh, scales that we use for tongue and palate uh, position, and so we're all put together differently. And so sometimes you look in somebody's mouth and you can see, you know, even below the the uvula, that little, little hangy down thing. Um, um, but then there's some patients where just the position size of the tongue and the relationship to the palate where, uh, and, and this, the, these grades three and four are ones where, um, they're going to be a little bit more challenging uh, to manage because that's probably, uh, ca causing some obstruction. And then we're always, you know, it's rare, but always looking for things like little lumps and bumps or stuff like that, that could be, uh, in the airway and, and potentially causing obstruction. Um, in the clinic setting, we'll sometimes do a flexible camera scope exam. So there's a certain amount of information you can get just by looking at a patient's nose and mouth, feeling their neck, um, but you can't see everything uh, very well. And so, especially when we're talking about sleep apnea, the structures that we're interested in might be in the very back part of the nose or behind the palate or down in the back uh, behind the tongue. And so uh, doing a, a flexible scope exam um, is Sometimes it's something we do. Um, uh, if anybody's ever had this type of procedure or, or who's have a COVID swab, which is probably everybody in the world, um, it's not super comfortable, um, right? And um, so um, we bear that in mind, of course, and try not to stress out patients more than we need to, but it is uh, a safe examination and it can be really, really helpful to, uh, again, if we're thinking about, okay, 
what's the anatomy that's causing the problem. This is a way that you can sometimes uh, key in on, you know, is it regrowth of the adenoid? Is it a, a position of the palate? Is it tongue position? Is there something at the level of the voice box? This scope exam can be helpful. But of course, uh, there are limitations to it because right? it's an uncomfortable examination. And uh, depending on the age and maturity level of the kid, they're uh, sometimes uh, sitting upright screaming at you, um, which is different, I hope, than how they sleep at home. Um, and so understanding sort of the tone and the position of the structures in the airway um, is going to be different depending on when you do the, the scope exam. Uh, uh, we've uh, thought of and tried to come up with ways of like, how do you look at that? Because they're not, you're probably not going to be able to sneak in and put a scope in their nose when they're actually just natural sleep. They would wake up. Um, and so um, we do additional things. Uh, so there's something called sleep endoscopy. This is far and away the most common uh, type of procedure that uh, is done across the country. There are some centers that do something called CINE MRI where they do MRI images in this what's called sagittal position where you're kind of looking from the side um, at a very specific interval where it almost looks like a movie kind of like still a patient's breathing and you can kind of see um, we here at our center do not do this um, there's actually only a couple places that do this and write a lot of papers about it but it's interesting um, but point being is in both situations the patient is actually under anesthesia um, it's not real sleep it's simulated sleep and the anesthesia uh, team we work very closely with them there's different types of agents that can be given that um um, helped really care that they have a scope in their nose, but it doesn't impact their respiratory uh, reflexes in the tone. And so it's a, it's a balance, right? Because I think you could collapse anybody's airway if you gave them enough anesthesia. Um, that's not the point. The point is to kind of try to find the plane of anesthesia that best mimics sleep. So that's, that's kind of what we do. And we have a, this picture on the uh, left side, the, the sleep endoscopy is, a, again, the same flexible camera scope like we would do in clinic except we're doing it in the operating room with the patient, you know, breathing spontaneously and under that light level of anesthesia. And so we're able to look at the, again, all the different levels of the airway to see if we can identify what's the anatomic obstruction. So what are we looking at? So, um, you know, the, there's the velum, which is the soft palate uh, in the back of the nose area, uh, advancing the scope a little bit further around the corner at the level of the palate or the tonsils is where, you know, the oral pharynx is gonna show us tongue or tongue base and then uh, larynx. And so these pictures are just a sampling of the types of pictures. Of, how do we turn this on again? There it is, okay. Um, excuse me. Um, these go kind of go this way. So this is kind of like at the level of the back. If we park the scope maybe right here and we're starting just to peek around the back of the palate. Some patients, they're wide open you can see the whole throat but there's some patients where the palate is really falling back and obstructing you know posteriorly and when i'm doing this is study or this um, type of procedure in the operating room i'll have the anesthesiologist is right there and we're working together i'm driving the scope but they're kind of holding uh, oxygen near the patient's breathing and but i'll sometimes ask them to do different maneuvers like pull the jaw forward maybe turn you know try to look at different positions are there different maneuvers that help us to better examine this anatomy um, the second row kind of shows like if it was bulging in from the side at the level of the oral pharynx, this is, you know, really big tonsils that are bulging in, but sometimes even just the, the side walls of the throat will sometimes collapse. Um, and then this bottom row is kind of looking at patients who have tongue pushing things back. And so this is like normal. There's a space between the tongue and the voice box, but and the more severe cases, the the tongue is being, uh, excuse me, the epiglottis and the, the voice box is being pushed, collapsed against the back wall of the throat by the tongue. <clears throat> um, there's a number of different studies that have looked at um, if a patient has persistent sleep apnea um, after uh, uh, surgery, where are the likely levels? Um, uh, Tongue and tongue base, especially, so there's tonsillar tissue we think of at the roof of the mouth. Those are the palatal tonsils. Uh, adenoid is in the way back part of the nose, but there's also uh, tonsillar tissue at the very back part of our tongue. And it's normal for it to be there, uh, but it's it too can become enlarged in a way where it kind of fills this space here and actually pushes the, the epiglottis back. And so that's kind of endoscopically uh, here what 
uh, E is epiglottis and LTH is <laughs> lingual tonsil hypertrophy uh, shows uh, that filling that space. And so there's procedures we can do to remove it um, and kind of shave that away. You're not removing tongue, you're removing tonsil tissue. Um, and there's different ways to do it. This is a one uh, way to do it. Um, and this kind of shows a before and after in the operating room of kind of the space that you can make. Um, helpful surgery, but not perfect. Um, when they've looked at sort of uh, just pediatric patients in general, cure rate, again, depends where you set the bar, uh, is uh, not awesome, but it's not terrible. And, and so to get a patient under five uh, uh, events per hour where is the level where you probably wouldn't do CPAP and symptoms probably would be much improved is uh, on the order of 50 to 60%. Um, this is one where they looked specifically at children with Down syndrome and similar numbers. Now, sometimes it's not the lingual tonsil or sometimes it is the lingual tonsil, but it's the tongue proper. Uh, and now it's, it's uh, maybe getting a little bit more dicey, but there are things that can be done with the tongue. Um, um, one, uh, and I kind of think of it as um, repositioning procedures, but also reduction procedures. So if we think it's a volume of tongue, uh, there's ways you can actually reduce the size of the tongue. Um, the, this one is called the midline posterior glossectomy. This is probably the most common uh, tongue reduction type procedure uh, and is done just through the open mouth. Um, there's a wedge that's kind of removed from the central portion. The reason, I was, watch out for those guys, um, and there, there's a, a wedge of tissue that's removed, uh, and then you can kind of suture that back together. Um, and this is a really busy slide, but it does show that um, in uh, 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 children with Down syndrome, they kind of, this, this study was interesting because they broke it down both on patients who are not obese uh, and versus who are obese, but then also through the course of the study, if they, if they gained weight and be, kind of got into that obese category, um, the results, again, a busy slide, but basically um, in general, some reduction in the overall, this is the number of uh, this uh, apnea hypopnea index. Um, for patients who are normal overweight, they actually had a really great re response, but um, not so much if the patient became overweight or if they remained overweight. Um, that makes sense. Looking further down the airway, there's a, um, a, 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 a something called the ring of Malaysia, which is um, a, um, kind of a hooding of these structures that are over the vocal cords um, that kind of cause, that kind of collapse in uh, during breathing. And so um, this is far more, the more classic version of laryngomalacia would be an infant who has inspiratory strider, uh, high-pitched breathing sound. Um, it's the, the most common cause of that. Uh, uh, but this can uh, actually uh, occur in a sleep variant um, where even patients as they're older uh, uh, can have, um, usually it's less strider, as, uh, although we sometimes see it with strider with exercise, but there's also a sleep variant where this can um, uh, be contributing to sleep apnea. So uh, again, different studies showing um, if this is the site of obstruction, uh, that uh, the success rate is on the order of uh, 60% or so. And the last one I'll talk about, and this, these are not all, all the surgeries. It does seem like there's a lot of surgeries. And there's actually other ones that I didn't talk about. Um, uh, the, 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 the one that's kind of the newest one, uh, and is, uh, probably something you've heard about just kind of through the, the popular media, um, is something called hypoglossal nerve stimulation. There's a company called Inspire, um, who's the main, um, uh, company that, that, uh, that provides this, this device. So basically it's, um, this is specifically for patients whose obstruction is occurring at the level of the tongue. And we're trying to move the tongue forward out of the airway uh, in the moment of breathing uh, during sleep. And so there's a uh, uh, generating device, and this is a surgically implanted device. Uh, there's three incisions, although some people do it with two incisions down here. There are two total, one for both these parts, but basically there's a, a generator here that has leads that come out. One is a sensing lead that, that is inserted or placed near the muscles of the, the chest where so it can sense the breathing pattern. Uh, and then the other... Uh, uh, lead is, um, this is the stimulating lead that goes to the uh, nerves that are protrusors of the tongue and supporters of the tongue. 
And so um, this is a device that can be turned off and on on your phone or a little remote control and um, can be calibrated to the amount of stimulus and the, the timing of it. But basically it kind of senses when you're breathing because when your chest is expanding, that's you're taking a breath in, that's when the upper airway is usually collapsing. And so there's a little stimulus that's sent to these nerves that, and this is usually just implanted on one side, um, but it's enough to stimulate the whole you know, front part of the tongue. It doesn't you know, stick the tongue out, <laughs> but it does support it and kind of pull it forward in a way that it opens the airway. And they can uh, tweak and titrate sort of the amount. You kind of think, well, if I'm getting these little electrocutions all night, how am I gonna sleep? <laughs> but they can kind of find that the level where it's not so stimulating that it wakes you up or, or bothers you, but it's enough to uh, open the airway. So this is something that uh, first was uh, introduced about 10 years ago. So it's uh, um, a, a newer technology uh, and has a, a pretty um, solid uh, um, uh, uh, study in adults. Um, introducing it to children, uh, like a lot of things has been a little, you know, sort of a, a later step, but this is something that has uh, been FDA approved for use in uh, adolescent uh, patients with Down syndrome um, who uh, already have their tonsils and adenoid out, have the obstruction occurring at the level where this could help, uh, don't have excessive central sleep apnea, um, and are not tolerating CPAP. Um, so, um, and the, the, there's studies that have initial studies to say, hey, we can do it. Uh, studies that have shown safety and more and more other studies coming out showing effectiveness. Um, and our group, in fact, uh, is going to be hopefully joining a, a larger multi-institutional uh, project looking at um, patients with treatment with this. How does it impact their day-to-day -day, uh, cognitive abilities and behaviors and things like that? Um, so it's, a, it's an exciting area of, um, of, our, of our field. That's it. Questions? Hmm? Yeah. I've always watched the scan of the paper charts for my own, my son has Down syndrome, mm -hmm. which is kind of because of that range, but I actually got pushed back from one of the particular pediatricians who said, I should be looking at the Down syndrome chart, which seems ridiculous, about 35 pounds heavier. Yeah. What do you consider? Do you use standard BMI charts or do you use the Down syndrome chart for your obesity? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the question is about um, the relationship of obesity uh, in children with Down syndrome uh, with sleep apnea and, and maybe other medical issues and that there's different growth charts and scales that we use for kids to say, you know, what uh, you're, uh, whether you're overweight or obese, uh, and that there's different ones for, um, uh, down syndrome, but also for non, non down syndrome. Um, I may open that up to my colleagues, uh, in that regard. Um, I would probably personally probably look more at the down syndrome one. Uh, but, but I, but I don't know, like, um, for, for the purposes of how I'm using that information, um, uh, I don't know that I have, uh, I mean, I think if they're uh, obese on the Down syndrome scale, they're going to be obese on the, 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 the non-Down uh, syndrome one. Um, for a lot of these studies, I think they're using the Down syndrome uh, scales, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. I could be wrong. Though. So, so there is not a published BMI chart for, um, so B BMI is body mass index, and it's, um, kilograms per meter squared. It's a, um, a way of looking at how proportional you are. And um, they did not publish the BMI charts for the Down syndrome uh, growth charts, partly because um, it was then assuming that people were going to be overweight or obese. And so for little kids, the weight for length charts tracked pretty closely. So the under three-year-olds, the um, Down syndrome growth chart has its own weight for length curve. It looks almost exactly like the one for um, the, the one from the CDC. The um, BMI curve, like I said, was not published for Down syndrome because they want people and the, the American Academy of Pediatrics does recommend using 
the CDC regular BMI growth curve. Um, so the Down syndrome growth charts are useful because the linear growth, the height growth um, looks different for a lot of folks. You know, in general, it's shifted down. A lot of folks with Down syndrome are shorter than their peers. Um, and so it can be useful that way, but using it for um, uh, how well proportioned somebody is, we really should be looking at the AAP or at the CDC curves because those are more appropriate. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the chat wants to know, can most of the scenarios mentioned be detected through endoscopy? Um, uh, yeah, so um, the, uh, I'm assuming that the question is of the diff these different surgeries, yeah. Uh, exactly. So I, I think, um, you know, we have a lot of different surgeries that we can do on the nose, tongue, palate, et cetera. Um, and it's not in anybody's interest to operate on the wrong thing. Right. And so, um, so really that's kind of really, we try to in our clinic exam, as well as in our, uh, sleep endoscopies in the operating room to, um, try to find the right target and, uh, and, and, you know, base our, surgical options on that specifically. Yeah. One more. Um, with the hypoglossal nerve stimulation, are additional surgeries required over time to change battery or other maintenance on the sensors? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, yes. They're, um, because it's a newer technology, newer being in the last decade or so, uh, it's evolving like all of our technologies do. Um, what we do know uh, about the uh, these implants is that um, one, they're um, modifying so that patients can, in the initial ones, you couldn't get an MRI scan after, but now you can with a certain kind of um, strength of the MRI uh, magnets. Um, but yeah, the, these are mechanical devices that are, don't uh, always just, you know, like our cars need uh, tune-ups and stuff like that. There's little things that can happen. So there's reports of the the, the wire leads um, breaking or just or or becoming having more uh, resistant flow. Those sometimes need to be adjusted. Um, but the batteries do as well. And I think it's they say every ten to eleven years, something like that. I think uh, is currently where where the, the manufacturers. So. Yeah, that that uh, you know, again, there's there's pros and cons to all these different options, but for sure, one for the hypoglossal nerve stimulator is just all the things that come along with a mechanical device in our body. Okay, all right. No,